Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. DJ here, Q Macro. Welcome to Hands On SAP Dev. And I see we've got a lot of viewers already. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, so Ronnie, welcome. Leo, I'm looking up here. Uh, VJ Vats, good uh, good day to you. Hello, DJ. It says, uh, Freddie, hello, Freddie. My nephew, Freddie, is on the live stream again. Please say hello to Freddie. Uh, aren't you at school today? Uh, what's going on? Uh, or, oh, are you on the bus on the way to school? Yes, of course. Um, so, yes, have a good day at school today, Freddie. Um, Helmut, good morning. And Robert, good morning. Uh, Gregor, Lupomania, good morning. Helmut, again, moin moin. Yes, of course. And Graham, Graham Robbo. We are honoured. We are honoured to have uh, have your presence here. Good evening, Graham. I guess uh, Henrik. Uh, good morning. Good morning to you as well. And uh, yeah, we've also got a special guest who uh, we'll introduce shortly. So this is going to be a really good episode. Um, yes, you're on the bus. So we have. Do we have our first ever live stream uh, participant on the bus on the way on his way to school? Well done, Freddie. Uh, that's really cool. Um, so good morning, Brenton. Good morning, Brenton. So yes, let's uh, let's get on. I've got my coffee here, although I've drunk most of it already. Um, uh, I thought for a change, I'd go for the uh, SAP Inside Track Frankfurt uh, Anniversary Edition, uh, fifth anniversary edition uh, mug of my coffee here. So yeah, uh, what have I got to show you today? Well, today we're going to talk about the SAP Business Application Studio. Um, and um, yes, uh, Gr Gregor, I also think it's all okay down under with the uh, the bushfires and everything. Thank goodness for that, uh, if that is the, the, the case. So uh, yeah, take care and look after yourself down there, um, uh, Graham. Um, yes, uh, don't forget, don't forget uh, Ronnie's uh, Hands on SAP Dev podcast episode from the car commute. Excellent. Uh, yes, we did have that as well. That's, that counts as well, Ronnie, of course. Um, but uh, I think, you know, Freddie's presence on the bus is, uh, is also special. Don't forget, if you haven't got any SAP hands-on SAP dev stickers, uh, let me know. Uh, my uh, direct messages are open. So just send me a DM with your address. Um, I've got them here, ready to send off. Uh, Freddie, you haven't got one of these either, so come round, come round after school tonight and uh, I'll give you one of these stickers. Uh, and you'll be super cool in school. That like even rhymes. So, um, yeah, hands on SAP Dev, what are we going to talk about? Yes, so let me move to uh, a very brief set of uh, things I want to share with you today. Uh, carpool hands on SAP Dev. Oh, that would be like awesome. In fact, Lightstream have just started this feature where you can do IRL in real life live streaming. So, you could do it from the car. Brenton, I'll do that with you if, uh, well, you're over tomorrow anyway. Maybe we should do live streaming from Port Street Beer House. Maybe not. Um, so a <laughs> couple of things I want to <coughs> show you before we dive straight in with our special guest, Marius Obert, who I can see is waiting there in the green room, which is really awesome. Uh, advent of code, it's almost the end of November, which means it's almost the start of December, and the advent of code uh, starts, unlocks on December the 1st. Some really awesome programming uh, challenges. Uh, we've mentioned this before. In fact, episode zero of Hands on SCP Dev, we sort of limbered, our, limbered up our brains warmed up our brains doing uh, one of the puzzles. In fact, Robert, I have something uh, for you. Uh, cheers, Graham. Cheers with the wine there. Uh, I'll cheers your wine with my coffee. Um, one thing, Robert, you asked something, uh, Robert Dino, you asked something on a, a couple of live streams ago about whether it was okay if you use you could use the, the sort of the test harness that I created and that we used in episode zero of Hands on SAP Dev. And the answer is yes. And in fact, um, I've uploaded that for, especially for you uh, and other people as well. So if you go to uh, QMacro hands on SAP dev uh, GitHub repo, that's where I do all my annotations, my draft annotations for the blog posts and say the live stream recordings. But I've also added that whole thing that we used um, uh, on episode zero. So it's got the test harness, it's got um, the, uh, I keep getting phone calls, Michelle's call, my sister Katie's call, uh, so uh, yeah, Freddie, your your mum's just called me. I thought it was okay. Um, oh, you got to go to school now. Bye. Um, okay, so we got the yeah the day one. There's the day one, for example, that we saw before, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Robert, please feel free. Uh, yeah, a nice Santa Claus gift. There we go. So that's that. Um, Project Eula is a really really good. This is what I wanted to try to show on Wednesday when we had Thomas Young on there. If you're not aware of Project Eula, it's got some really nice, fairly simple maths puzzles. Um, I'm not a maths person, but you know it, they're easy enough for me to follow. 
and I use those to sort of uh, stretch my brain in the morning. And I use REPL IT, which is an awesome uh, online REPL for different languages. And I've got a little project, a project here, which I'll maybe go through. I know that Al Templeton has been interested, uh, and other people as well, in more functional programming stuff. So I've got some solutions here that I've been doing with Rounder, um, for example, here. So it's, it's an awesome sort of online um, uh, REPL for, for building stuff. And you import libraries like Rounder. That's that. Uh, and now to our uh, superhero uh, guest of the day. You've seen him before, actually, in episode 20-something. Th uh, Marius came on. I'm sure you know Marius. He's a colleague and friend of mine in uh, developer relations. Uh, and uh, so there he is. That's what he looks like. And where we go. And in fact, there's a couple of, um, a couple of blog posts that I wanted to uh, share with you as well. The first one. Um, is uh, showcasing SAP Business Application Studio. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And I'm going to um, just move this slightly. Uh, can I um, move that up a bit? Uh, yes, I can do a bit of a chat. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, there we go. Yes, perfect. I can put that link in there. Uh, hopefully, that will appear soon. There's a great uh, blog post by Nia. And also, uh, in Marius's excellent Cloud Foundry Fun, um, series of blog posts. Uh, he also talks about the Business Application Studio. So you've got those two links there um, to find out more. But without further ado, I'm going to stop talking now because it's already uh, seven minutes past eight uh, local time. And um, we're going to uh, bring in Marius, who is, like I say, sitting there in the green room, uh, waiting all uh, nice and... Um, uh, there we go. So there we go. So Marius, good morning. Good morning, teacher. How are you doing? Very well, very well indeed. So please, somebody on the chat, uh, tell me that you can see uh, Marius's screen. In fact, I think you can see, um, yeah, you, oh, yes, Marius, you're, you you confused me there because you had exactly yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah, it seems that we arranged it, but this is really <laughs> a coincidence. <laughs> That, that, that's a that's a, um, a sign of a true uh, you know team that works closely together has the same same uh, same brain. Um, yeah, we're thinking about the same things. But I was confused because you're using dark mode Chrome and I'm not. It's like yeah, what? yeah. what's happened to my Chrome? But it's your web page. Uh, you see him, Robert. Also, do you also hear uh, Marius? I'm, I'm slowly but surely getting used to this. Um, uh, this uh, see his dark Chrome to this uh, light stream, uh, we hear him too. Brilliant, okay, so I'm not gonna mess with any of the audio mix of things. Uh, yeah, welcome, this is your second time on uh, Hands-on SAP Dev, that's awesome. Um, and you're gonna talk about the uh, Business Application Studio, right? Correct, so um, you already did a great introduction when showing these two blog posts that I think both of them already got a lot of views and that also resonates with what uh, I heard during all targets this year, especially the one in Vegas when no one was really expecting the business application studio. And um, people were really like super buzzed about like, what's this new web IDE? Is it a new web IDE? What can I do with it? What's the difference? And they were all like super excited. And I really liked the way they introduced it because it was, I mean, very developer friendly because they didn't say this is this new product released next year or something. It was really like, oh, by the way, we have this product and we do a workshop with it now. It's not available yet, but we'll do this workshop or the sensor session with this product. And I think this is really like a great way to introduce the development environment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's sort of partly the sort of release early, release often, not quite the release early that most people understand there. But I, I, I also totally agree. It was a really nice way of sort of bringing it on board. Yes. So, and uh, yeah, this is also because, I mean, there's always this chicken egg problem. Oh, you, you can, can release, release early, but then is the documentation already ready? Is our tutorials already there? So what comes first? And uh, I think that's why I, it makes sense to do this session here today, just to show everyone what you can do hands-on with the Business Application Studio, maybe even though that there are not a lot of tutorials or hands-on sessions out there right now. So this is basically what I had planned for today, but there's I don't have like a perfect band that we have to follow. So it's really just talking about what it is. And if you have questions, uh, you can ask them as well. I will try to answer them. And then we'll just like take a tour through the business application studio. Great. Thank you. 
Um, in fact, um, Amit and uh, Eleanor have just told me, and Gregor, there was a bit of an echo, but that's because I had two iobuts microphones in my uh, live stream. I don't know why. So it's completely my fault, nothing to do with Marius. So I think we're good now, right? Okay, so over to you, Marius. Okay, perfect. So the first thing I want to show is what we're going to build. I mean, it is very close to what I've described in this blog post. So we'll write a simple uh, open UL5 application that uses the destination services to access data from the North Rhine uh, public O data service that I'm sure most of you are already familiar with. So it's my favorite O data service. Yeah, it's like the classic, like everyone knows it, everyone loves it. <laughs> Everyone has set it up a million times in the cloud platform in the destination. <laughs> so we basically, that's already the first step, um, prepare the setup. As I already said, it's, everything is described here. I just want to um, show you this tutorial in case you're not aware of it, create a web frontend with SAP UI 5 and web ID. Basically, we'll do a very similar, we build almost the same application up until this tutorial here. So I think we'll stop at this point. Cool. But if you're curious about SAP UI 5 and you want to do more, you can also check out this tutorial, create a web front end with SAP UI 5 in Web IDE. But today we'll obviously do it in the Business Application Studio. I'm sure that uh, there are some awesome folks on the chat that are going to be looking up that and posting the uh, link in the, in the chat. So that's awesome. Uh, I've got my uh, suspicions as to who that might be. Awesome. So, um, what you see here is basically the SAP Cloud Platform cockpit. I guess some of you are already familiar with it. And we're at a destination step. So this is basically where we define where do we, should our UI apps be able to communicate to. And here there are two destinations in there. One is the North Rhine service. The other one is the ES5, the SAP demo system that uh, is available on the internet for everyone or for everyone with an SAP user. And this is, as you can see in the URL, the production account, because as of today, uh, there is no, it, the Business Application Studio is not available in the trial. But uh, if you have a production account, you can already use it today. And uh, yeah, we'll come to that maybe at the end of the show, how you can set it up if you have time. If we don't have time, um, there's also this showcasing uh, SAP Business Application Studio blog post that you mentioned. Yeah. And it's described in there how you can uh, access the account. Cool. So let's have our first look in it. I hope the font size works out for everyone. Oh, yeah, so uh, folks on the chat, just uh, let us know if uh, the font needs to be a little bigger, maybe one bigger, uh, Marius. OK. So this Thanks. is basically the, your first touch point of the Business Application Studio. And here you can already see there are dev spaces. And dev spaces are an interesting concept because the thing I didn't like so much about a web ID as it is today is that we don't have full access to the system. So there's no terminal. I cannot install my own tools. I cannot run the tools from the command line. So with, for example, the trigger build of my applications. Yeah. And uh, this is something that's totally different in this new business application studio because you have control about your own dev space. And a dev space basically comes with all the tools that you need to develop your software or to, to develop your business applications. And uh, by the way, each uh, dev space is a Kubernetes pod. So everything that you have in here runs on Kubernetes. So for now, I just, create, I just created this space like a couple of minutes ago just to have one. But we can create a new one here mm -hmm. to show you this wizard. And there you see that you have a very sh a short form where you define the name of the dev <coughs> space. Let's just say hands-on2. And then you can select what kind of applications you want to develop. A basic application, that is really just a minimal, uh, like minimal set of tools that you need. Then you can select Fiori applications, where you have different tools that you might already be familiar with, like the MTA tools, um, the, what, the, the generator to create your UI5 application, and the UI5 layout editor that you're already familiar with from the web IDE. But for now, I just to show you the full thing, like what we have here, I select cloud business application. And then so, I'll just... so these are like sort of bundles of extensions uh, by theme, right? Is that a good way of looking at it? Yes, yes, that's how you could call it. Yes. So, and I mean, it's, it's not only plugins, it's really a mix of stuff that is 
will be pre-installed. It's it could be editor plugins, it could be CLI tools, it could be whatever you can think of what you can install on your local machine. That's also what you can install here. And this is usually very fast in starting up. So but see it's already here. Awesome. So let's just use the new one. So I don't we don't need the one that I prepared. Nothing up your sleeve, nothing up your sleeve. No. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on your t-shirt by the way just uh, stand oh, up again it says oh it sap says, community yes <laughs> so and here you can see a ui that you are maybe already familiar with because it looks very uh similar to vs code right yes and this is because the business application studio is based on eclipse Thea, and that project itself is based on uh or is compatible with vs code as well and uh, I mean, you've already noticed that I'm a fan of the dark theme. So maybe that's the first thing we can change here. Set a theme, dark theme, ta-da. Nice. Nice. And another thing that I always like to change first is um, the preferences. There's this really cool feature in VS Code as well as in uh, Eclipse Thea, which is format on safe. Do you use that, DJ? I, I do, uh, not in VS Code, but I have done in the past with Vim. Um, yeah, I quite, I quite like that. I, it does take some getting used to, but um, I think I need to embrace it more. Yes, I, I really like this feature because my code, when I write it, the, the white spaces look really bad. And sometimes, I mean, I'm not consistent. Sometimes I use tabs, sometimes I use spaces. <laughs> and it's really good to have this tool running through every time I save a file just to make sure that it's my code actually looks nice. <laughs> yeah, that there's there's a um, there's a really interesting philosophy in the Go language community where actually code formatting you know is defined with a one strict standard and everybody's code looks the same or is formatted the same and that's that's almost like the extreme end end of this sort of uh, spectrum. But yeah, it's interesting. Yes, I'm, I'm, I really like that that all the code looks the same. I mean, sometimes I see code that I can tell it's formatted, but I'm like. Who comes up with this format? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes I really think like, are these three spaces somewhere? Or no? Um, maybe, maybe a plus, a, a control plus on this, please. Okay, one more. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, let's see if I'm, I'll be able to code with this. <laughs> so um, <laughs> the first thing that I want to do, what I've already like teasered, uh, teased you with, is this open terminal. So you can see I really have a full terminal here. With a Unix-based system, and I can do, uh, yeah, install software. For example, uh, as we write a UI5 application, some of you might know that I've written this generator for UI5 applications a while ago. That's awesome, yeah. It's called Generator EC UI5. Let's install it. And the cool thing is, why do I use this one and not a generator that's already installed here? First, because I think the, my generator is. Uh, I know it better because obviously I've written it. So, and I know how to deploy it easy to Cloud Foundry. The second thing that I really like about is that this shows how open the platform is. Yep. If you say you have your own generator because you customize something for projects that you, I mean, you have very similar projects and you could benefit from writing a generator once and reusing it, then you could just bring it into the business application studio as well. So you don't have to like stick with the default generator that SAP provides. Exactly. You'll have so, installed that in, in your home directory there, I think. Yes, yes. I, I mean, I, the home directory is the first directory that uh, yeah. opened up when I opened the terminals. I installed it. And now let's, what, let me think, what should we do first? Let's, uh, let's... Well, I think, I think in, terms of, in terms of demonstration, I mean, you've demonstrated the most important feature yeah. ever, which of course is the terminal, right? But anyway, that's, that's uh, because I'm, I'm, everybody knows I'm a big fan of the terminal. So the, to be able to access real a real os in the in the ide just like you can do with vs code and everything i think is absolutely you know mega move yes and uh, the, also what i really love about this business application studio is i mean dj you remember the the code jams that we run uh, regularly yep and uh, we always or have the most issues or attendees have the most issues with setting up the environment and now i just went to this website and that I don't have to set up anything for SAP yeah, Cloud development. That's, that's so good. Everything's already there. Also, like all the tools that you might know. So, for example, this MBT tool. Yeah. It's there. That's the new build tool, by the way. 
if people yes, want to. Yeah, so it's, uh, that's a tool we use later to package uh, cloud applications together into a deployable unit. If you use the UL5 tooling, it's here. What, uh, what tools do you usually use as DJ? The CFC line, for example. Yes, the CF command line. I, I mean, I use all sorts of sort of normal Linux command uh, command line tools. I use, yeah, I mean, I use Ranger. I use you know all sorts of different things. Yeah. So this is really like your one-stop shop. You open the website. You can do it from your own device, from a device of a colleague. From if you want to check something really fast, it's really like the same environment everywhere. Mm. everywhere. And the cool thing about desk spaces is, is that you share the home directory. So if you set up custom scripts here and then you say maybe uh, okay now you want to do only ui development you can switch to another dev space but the home directory will be the same you will have the same scripts you'll have the same files there and it, i think this is a really cool feature because you don't have to set up every test space from scratch you only you define your desk space one uh, your home directory in one desk space and you can use it from all other desk spaces as well that's awesome. In fact, I didn't, I didn't even uh, realize that was uh, that was possible. So that's awesome. I mean, also um, HP uh, uh, Hans Peter Zeitz has just also said NVM, which of course is an, another tool that I use I with NVM to, to manage uh, manage the node uh, different node versions. I'm a big fan of NVM, but anyway, that's, uh, I've never used it. I mean, I know use NVM as well on my machine. I've never tried it, so this is a life experiment. And no, well, you have to yeah, you have to <laughs> with curl, but yeah. Yeah, but I thought maybe it already comes with it, but uh, it comes with uh, the latest uh, LTS version of yeah. uh, Node.js, and also, I mean, obviously NPM as well. Okay, so let's get started. What is the first thing that I could show you here? I want to create a project, and there are two ways. So, I mean, if you know my generator, you know it's a human generator that I could invoke with yo. Yo. And then I see easy UI 5 here. But just also a different way. Let me try to find out. I can use uh, the command palette that you know from VS Code, like with uh, Command Shift P or F1. For Windows, it's probably Control Shift P. Yep. And then I can ask, I can search for commands. And there's also human here, so I can select human. Oh, I have to open the workspace first. Okay, so. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do this. Open a workspace, user, this is where we are. So that's so in the graphical UI then, you've just actually you were looking at your home directory that you're in on the terminal, right? That's all all the same. Yes, thing. yes. So sorry, that was probably too fast. And then whenever I select another home terminal, it takes some time. Maybe they'll change it in the future to basically refresh the page, but it's really a matter of seconds. Yeah. So Let's try it again. F1, yo. And this is now here. I can see basically all generators in this command palette. So I can select easy UI 5, app. So here, what you see here is basically in human, you can have sub generators and main generators. And app is per convention the name of the main generator. So I yeah. app. Where would I like to deploy the application to? Let's use an app router on Cloud Foundry. Let's use OpenUI 5 from a content delivery network. I could also select OpenUI 5 from local resources. Mm -hmm. But for now, content and CDN is fine. How do I want to name the project? Subdef and the namespace is hands on. I hope I'm not too fast. No, I think it's good. I think people would say, I mean, we've got an awesome crowd here as usual, and uh, they'll, they'll always help us out in terms of speed and you know microphones okay. and videos and everything. So that's good. Awesome. So um, next, it asked me what uh, view type would I like to use. And just for demonstration purposes, I could also start typing XML. So oh, I thought you I thought you were going to choose choose JavaScript just because you know just to annoy everybody. But no, 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 don't choose. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do okay, no, <laughs> I won't. <laughs> I keep main view as the name of the view. And basically, here you can already see that it created all the files for me. And it's running npm install after that. But uh, you can already see the files I created here. Let's just switch the workspace to only see this project here. So I can say open workspace. Nice. And select this project I just created. 
There's a similar concept in uh, VS Code as well, isn't there? Yes, yeah. It's a, if you use VS Code, you know this concept very well already. So let's open a new terminal. <laughs> Uh, now Pete's just said, I wish it had Java views because I love Java. <laughs> That's something for Max. <laughs> I, actually, the one this is running, I, did, I, I remember I wrote a blog post, I did a comparison of size between all the different view types, XML, JavaScript, JSON, and HTML. And the, the result was quite interesting, actually. Um, I'll have to dig that up and uh, share that on Twitter later on. That was a long time ago. So what I do first here is basically, I have, you see, I have this uh, directory where my web app and all your five files are. And I have another one that's called App Router. And this is the App Router we're going to start later that will serve our UI5 app mm -hmm. application in Cloud Foundry. So the first thing that we do here is basically we have to define a destination. Remember when we want to pull data from Northwind? So this is basically uh, here we have to link this Northwind service. And uh, the way you can do it is just by adding a new route here in this uh, routes array. Yeah. And the syntax is very easy, but to keep it short, I'll just copy it from my blog post. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, typing typing stuff live is good if it's in like a normal programming language, but when you're typing JSON live, I think it's uh, fraught with difficulties. Yeah. And now here's already the first trick. I hit Command S. And it auto formatted everything for me. In fact, the, 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 that was the first trick. But the zeroth, zeroth trick, thinking of um, some debugging I did with Max yesterday, was putting that route before the catch all route. Otherwise, it's never going to be yeah. uh, uh, caught. Good. So, uh, yeah, that was, that was obviously a, a, a goes without saying. But I think that's, that, that, that was a gotcha that uh, bit us in the, in the backside yesterday. Yeah, I think now that you say it, because it happened to me quite often as well. It would be great if the editor would complain and say something like, if you write a return statement, but you do something else after the return statement, something that it recognizes, oh, by the way, this route catches yeah. everything. You, do, are you sure you want to define routes after that route? Exactly. That in fact, yeah. It, I had that, that thing this morning. I was doing some uh, uh, Project EULA stuff really early this morning, and I was trying to export something from a module in JavaScript. Um, but it wasn't working, and it's because I re suddenly realized that the export statement was after a return statement. It's like, oh. yeah. anyway. That, no, that's, maybe I should I'd let, write it down. So, <laughs> so I uh, it. James said, <laughs> sounds like a job for a linter. I think that, that's totally right. Um, also, uh, I think I must be a typo, uh, Leo, because uh, I've just seen Leo say Java and then put a heart sign. So that must be, that must be an error with Twitch somehow. I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> yeah. That cannot be right. <laughs> can't be right. So uh, what we do now, the first thing is that we start this app router as it is. So um, that's it. I, I mean, I can show you here in cut. There's a in the package of JSON file. Oh, one second. Oh, I went in the wrong directory. Yeah, I want to be sure. app router. By the, the way, the, that sort of Google Chrome sharing thing is in the way. Can you move it to the maybe the oh, top of your screen? Oh, I can move it. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I um, I executed npm install from the wrong folder from a web app instead of app router. So I just had to do it again. Um, it's already done. So what I can show you here with either cut is the package or JSON, where you can see this one script that says local. And here it basically uh, ah, okay. start this. Um, what do I do? I start this uh, app router from a local directory. But um, what you see here is I define a destination in the access app JSON. And this is in the Cloud Foundry application. So I have to link it to a, um, how to say, to a destination instance, uh, destination service instance on Cloud Foundry. So this is that's almost the same as linking it to a destination in Neo. So the the Neo app .json link uh, is is very very similar, but in the Cloud Foundry case, you have an instance of the destination service rather than just a destination. Exactly, exactly. So let's. Uh, I mean, I will show you that it fails when I start it now, because if I say npm run local, it will fail. And let me make that a little bit larger so you can read it. 
basically the error message is route references unknown destination north range because for exactly that reason that the application is not bound to an uh, it's not bound to a service instance of type destination yet so let's do that and here you can basically if i execute cf apps you'll notice i'm not logged in to this cloud foundry cli and i could do it with cf login here but i could also use this uh, how to say this text field or label here on the bottom mm -hmm. that shows me that I'm not logged into Cloud Foundry yet. Yeah. So the first thing I have to do is define the endpoint. I'm in EU10, enter my email address. I like the way that this uses the command palette as a sort of a generic UI input thing. Yes, that's really cool. And then it will take a couple of seconds. And here I can already see my, select my Cloud Foundry organization and my space. And now you've been logged in. And I can already see here, now I'm targeting uh, my space in Cloud Foundry. Let's remove that. And the cool thing is, if I run CF apps now, I'm logged in. So I logged in into the uh, business application studio, but I'm also logged in on the cloud, uh, on the CLI immediately. So basically, it's it's using the same mechanism. So same. Yeah, really nice. So and I could do a CF create service here, or Again, I could use the command palette, CF, create a new service instance. Oh. So you get the best of both worlds, really. Yes, that, that's really what I like. And it's still like very developer friendly and everything. So um, I clicked somewhere else to uh, cancel this operation because I want to show you how and why I re uh, choose the name for this uh, destination service. So basically, I want to reuse the same service for the application <laughs> when I deploy it later, as well as for local testing. I mean, that's just for convenience in real development scenarios, I probably would not use the same service instance. Yeah. But I think for now, for demo purposes, this is fine. So I yeah. just se select this, uh, or I copy this uh, resource name. Same command again. I use this resource name here for the third name of the service instance. Now it asks me, what type of service instance do you want? I select destination. And then it asks me for the service plan. There's only one, so I select light. So this is really a really nice. Um, uh, I mean, for for those of you who are not familiar, this is actually just doing what you would do on the CF command line as well, and creating a new instance of yeah. that service. And you choose the light is the is the is the plan that's available to trial users, for example. Um, so, yeah, really, really nice. Graham has just said, uh, well, in fact, lots of great comments here. Graham has said, uh, this is so much more target aware than Web IDE. Um, I think I know what you mean, Graham. Um, maybe you could expand in the comments what, what you mean there for, for the other folks as well. Uh, Napit is saying it's beautiful. And uh, Amit, this is just wow. I think, I think uh, yeah, I think people like this. And you know, no wonder, because I think it's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's great to hear that feedback. I it resonates, or it's basically also what I heard at other events. That people look at it and they're like, really, really, wow, this is amazing. This makes my life so much easier. Yeah. And um, so for now, uh, we created a service instance, but it's somewhere in Cloud Foundry now. So now we have to basically add a reference to this service uh, instance in this app router here. Yeah. You could do the same thing uh, with the command palette again, say bind service. Uh, is it called bind? Let's just write service. Bind services to a. Oh, yeah. Now I'm confused. I thought it's called bind, but let me check again in the. Here in the, in the blog post. Yeah, yeah. Instance. I'm a big fan of the old saying uh, measure twice, cut once. <laughs> yes. Okay, bind the service instance to a locally running app. So, locally. That's it. It says MTA module. Interesting. I think it might have changed. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, this looks different. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> so what happened before is basically when I selected Interesting. Now, okay, let's just do it manually in this case. Yeah, let's do it, let's do it what happened before is uh, 
it created a source instance for me. Uh, I, I used the other one. Let's see what happens. But what should happen is that it creates a service key for the service instance and saves the service key in the dot environment for, uh, in a file dot env. Yeah. And this is basically where my locally uh, local application could pick the service key up. Because a service key for for an instance of a service is required if you want to call that service from outside the cloud platform effectively. Exactly. Yes. By the way, uh, Graham has just uh, expanded on his his comment, and I, yeah, I, I did uh, did get that. Um, by target aware, I mean we can do deployment target stuff without having to jump out into other tools. Precisely, yeah. I mean, I think this is this is so much more comfortable for uh, for uh, for development and DevOps stuff. Okay, so you can see what's happening. I mean, I I just ran through the wizard, selected a service that I had. Uh, that I want to use, and now it told me, okay, successful bind service into um, this env dot file. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, this is because I selected a different module. If I look at it here, I see vcap services, which is the mm -hmm. default uh, environment variable for Cloud Foundry uh, service instances that are bound. Then the name of the service, uh, the name of the service type, name of my service. And here, after a while, you basically see a key. So yep. let's just move this file to the app router where it should be. And if I try to restart start my app router now again, it should not fail anymore because now it can connect to the it can connect to the service instance. And in the success message, you see, I will show you uh, again if you because you cannot read it because the font is too big. AppRooter is listening on port 5000. And then the, the business application studio notices automatically, oh, there's a, an open port. Do you want to expose the port to the web? And I say, yeah, this is exactly what I want. So I open. I can define a name. I don't have to. So I just confirm with enter. Mm -hmm. And this is, ta-da, here's my UF5 application running already in the cloud. It's running, not yet deployed. But we'll do that later because as of now it is still empty, as you can see here. So, so just to, just to be clear, um, you said it's running in the cloud. Of course, it is running in the cloud, as in it's running in the cloud because the business application studio is in the cloud and it's running locally, quote unquote, in the business application studio. So, as you say, it's not yet deployed to Cloud Foundry, which is also the cloud. So that's just to, just to make, and I think this. Oh, has, I'm sure I saw something, a, a chat from Napit earlier on about um, Google Cloud Platform. I missed what it was. But this is a sort of thing that the uh, Google Cloud Platform um, uh, terminal workspace does as well. You can run something locally there, and you can expose that port or forward that port effectively. So this is the same sort of thing, right? Exactly. Very same concept, same idea, port forwarding. Yes. So, and. Um... I mean, you're having an eye on the chat, right? So, if there are questions, yes, you're... yes. Okay, In fact, there's there's a there's a couple of questions actually. What uh, one from uh, from Napit? Uh, are these options coming based? So, these options that you were just using before, I guess. Oh, it's just gone. Hold on a second. Are these options coming based on the file, or is it generic? For example, for XS app, it will give some some options, and for a view, some other options in F1. Um, oh. Uh... Okay, that's a good question. So I think at first, the um, options are the, the uh, commands I used most recently. And I think then it's just alphabetically sorted. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. I think it is the same in VS Code. I, I don't know if it's plug in. I think, yeah, it's just, just recently used and then all the rest. And whatever I type, then I'll apply and filter to the options. And there's another question from uh, JR Fury. Um, any news on when the MBT tool node module will be released for generating MTA apps locally so I don't have to deploy, so you have to deploy each module individually? I mean, the MBT tool itself is already out there on the uh, on the registry, right? Yes, and uh, MBT, the cool thing is, it is um, not in beta anymore since a couple of, I think, two weeks. Yeah. So uh, if you look for the uh, NPM MBT, this is how you can get it. When you click on homepage to end up at the Git repository, you see the code. They are usually very active. So you see last commit 17 hours ago. And um, for more information, there's also a user guide. So Git, GitHub pages, really cool, show you what is the MBT, 
how you can download it. I mean, you can download the source code straight. You can use NPM to install it. I mean, even though the tool itself is written in Go, basically we use uh, NPM here just as a distribution distribution mechanism because this way we can distribute binary <laughs> and it will be um, appended to your path automatically, so you don't have to um, mess with the paths. So. But the tool itself is written in Go, as you can see yeah. in the GitHub repository. And usual documentation, what commands are available. Very nice. Or you can new migrate projects when you when you were using the Java-based project before. You shouldn't, I mean, it should work out of the box or only with a minimal set of changes. I think also in the Web IDE, um, MBT is now an option in the uh, context menu for builds. So I think that it even says um, the original build tool is deprecated. And then it gives you the option to use the MBT based one as well. well I didn't even know. I'm, see, I'm so in the business application studio that I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> nice. There's lots, lots of, lots of questions here. Um, let me see if I can pick out another one. Um, so Amit is asking, how can service keys be handled when code moves to subsequent landscapes? So, so I guess this is a management of configuration across dev, test, and prod landscapes, right? Hmm. I'm not sure if I understand the question. How are the how are they handled in case uh, how do you like sp uh, save them in dot uh, env files or do you mean how you can like create new service keys or how to manage? I'm not them? Yeah, I'm not sure. That's that's. Uh, I mean, maybe you could expand on that, Amit. But also maybe that. I mean, that's. Uh, I've got an inkling as to what the answer might be, and it's it's quite a long winded answer. Uh, so maybe we'll cover that in a, in another episode or uh, maybe. Maybe online in, on, on Twitter or something. Um, yeah, I don't think we can probably answer that one uh, in detail there. Um, and finally, Insane Brood, who seems to be a Go fan, which is great. Um, uh, Marius, hi, DJ and Marius, uh, got a question. I'm currently doing uh, some stuff with flow graphs, replication tasks, HDB synonyms on Cloud Foundry using Web IDE. Is this something that is considered for Business Application Studio? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at, I've got a really small video of Marius's face thinking, uh, trying to read what he's going to say. It's like, mm, I don't know. Does Marius know? Uh, not sure yet, to be honest. Um, I think what, what is fair to say is that eventually the business application studio will be the go to IDE. They are moving, they are, they're, they're migrating uh, tools and plugins and extensions that are available on Web IDE to the business application studio, that's an ongoing process. Um, but I'm not sure of, of uh, the sp specific timelines for the tools that are used for this. Yeah, the, um, very good answer. And uh, I think it's really worth emphasizing that if you're using that by every day and you're used to it and you really want to stick with it, you don't have to be afraid that we'll turn off the web ID anytime soon. So no, exactly. And in fact, um, Insane Brood, it sounds really strange saying Insane Brood. Insane Brood is uh, uh, mentioned that the old one was deprecated this Wednesday. So yes, that since yesterday, uh, since Wednesday. So maybe it's worth asking Nia on that blog post that we posted a link to earlier on, um, asking there. Yeah. I think that, that I mean, Noah is definitely the expert on uh, if you have some product related questions or roadmap, so I think that's a good idea to ask to buy yeah. a comment in that blog post. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and Robert Dino says uh, SAP and one tool to rule them all. Uh, SAP Business Application Studio looks really cool. Uh, he's just getting excited about Visual Studio Code in the cloud thanks to recent uh, uh, SCN blog post. Yeah, so that's the really the really cool thing is that things seem to be converging enough. For, for things to make sense for us as developers, right? Nice. Uh, ba -ba -da -ba -da. Wow, this is this is this chat is amazing. It's far too much for me to keep up on. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. One more. Oh yes. So Robert is pointing out to some uh, pointing some blog posts from uh, Kevin Hu. Um, in fact, I sent Kevin, Kevin's in Australia, right? I sent Kevin some hands-on ICP dev and other stickers. So yeah, I know Kevin. Um, that's right, he's making an English Premier League app with SAP Cloud Application Programming Model uh, using and using Visual Studio Online in part five. So thanks thanks for the link to there, Robert, yeah. Okay, perfect, so. Um, Visual Studio Online is also an interesting project. Uh, basically, a similar idea, but obviously less SAP focused, so yeah. 
but also very interesting also online editor so i think we can see a clear trend here also it's not as famous anymore but if you are familiar with cloud nine which yeah was a startup they did a, also an online id a couple of years ago they got acquired by aws yeah so i think now all big i mean i'm not sure about gcp maybe they already have something maybe they will release something but all other big cloud vendors they already have online ids so i think there's a clear trend noticeable on that definitely i mean i i do remember cloud nine in fact i remember when it was called bespin or bespin you know from from i think it's from star wars right it's a planet or something i don't know um but that it was originally created if i remember rightly by uh dion almer and ben galbraith who um were at the time um well developer advocates actually for is it for google or something anyway they created the spin which became cloud nine and uh yeah the rest is history it was also i think one of the very first um you know nice looking online ides and google cloud platform does have napit uh, correct me if i'm wrong but google cloud platform or the gcp terminal i can't think of the right word but the gcp um online instance that everybody can use has a fairly rudimentary ide i think that's also based on uh, not Eclipse Thayer, but Eclipse, is it Eclipse Orion? Um, but yeah, you, you can do some online, you know, unless you want to use, um, you know, a proper editor like Vim in the terminal, you know, you can use, uh, you know, an ID. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I yeah, Git has its own IDE as well. There's, um, there's Git pod, um, oh, sorry, GitHub. And in fact, the thing I showed earlier this morning, um, it sounds, it feels like ages ago now, um, Repl IT, is an awesome IDE um, that can also link to your GitHub account as well. So that those those project Euler problems I was working on there in a repo on my GitHub as well. Anyway, anyway, we uh, these are wonderful digressions. Um, I'm sure you've got some more to some, some more stuff to show us, right? Yes, yes. Um, we're almost at the end, so I think there's no need to rush. Um, you've seen the application is still kind of blank and doesn't show a lot of information. So let's change that. Um, Add something to the view. I mean, a simple list control with a standard yeah. list item. Standard that list item is what and still is my favorite UI5 control. I don't know why it just looks so beautiful and simple. It's simple. It's really like, I mean, really, you don't have to be a UI5 expert to understand what's going on there. It's the beauty of XML, also. Yeah, the beauty of XML. You heard it here, here first. The beauty of XML. <laughs> and here, so um, basically, if you're a UI5. Uh, if you're familiar with UI5, you know what I'm doing here. I go to the view, open it in the code editor, <clears throat> and just paste it in here. Ah, oh, that looks familiar. Happy days. Here it is. So, um, also the controller. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just add one more function in the controller, say handle list item press, and then I show a message. Uh, I just show us a message in a message box. So let me, I have to be careful in copy and pasting because now I select a different name and a namespace won't match up here. Sure, that's okay. Well, while you're doing that, um, the Einzige Ware Kobold uh, is asking, will the plugins be available for VS Code? Now I think- <laughs> I've seen it more coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, um, do, you, do you want to answer that or shall I? Yeah, you, you go for it first. So, I mean, you really have to specify here because what plugins so far, we weren't using a lot of plugins. We were using Human that is open source. Anyone can install it. We were using the ECUF5 generator. Everyone can install. I think this one, I'm not sure if this is a custom development or if that's also a public uh, plugin for Eclipse Theory or VS Code. But I think except of this Cloud Foundry thing that I used here, everything is open source. Yep. Also this MVT tool, it's from SAP, but it's open source. So, so far, um, everything is probably already available. But I, I understand the question and there are, I mean, many examples like the UI5 tooling and the MVT tools and other plugins like the, help me the, for the CDS, the, Oh yeah, the, uh, the 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 CDS um, extension for VS Code. Yeah. So I think most of uh, all teams that I'm speaking to, they notice that they say, "Okay, when I already develop it, why don't I release it open source as well?" Yeah, but not only that, but why don't I release it as a as an extension 
a usable extension for VS Code, which means also a usable extension for Web Application Studio. Um, I was talking to a team last week. They were showing me some awesome stuff, which I'm not allowed to talk about yet. Um, for relating to uh, CAP and CDS and sort of data modeling and everything. And they're building those as VS Code extensions, which you know is for me the exactly the right way to go about things. Yes. I, I mean could have said it better. It's really like if it, they do it anyway, why don't they do it uh, like for VS Code, for example, write a plugin? Because ideally it will work for the business application studio anyway, because it's based yeah. on uh, it's compatible to the VS Code. I, I shouldn't say based on it's compatible to the VS Code uh, mm -hmm. uh, API. So the last thing that we do here, I mean, we created now, uh, we added the logic to the controller, to the view. Yep. Now we just have to define the data source, the North Hawaiian data source in the UI5 application, because as of now, only the app router knows it. Yeah, and we're going to define this in the manifest, right? Exactly. The UI5 expert, DJ, you also have a UI5 path, right? <laughs> I, was, I was talking to Max yesterday, and I was thinking, God, you know, with UI5 is, Ronnie, what version is UI5 at right now? Is that 170-something? Yeah, I remember when UI I first started playing around with UI five when I first discovered it. It was one point two. Oh well, okay. <laughs> when, which year was that? Nineteen sixty four. Wait, sorry. I, I was just making nineteen sixty four. No, I'm not sure. Oh, about. okay. So no. <laughs> I thought it's like a, okay. No, no matter. I thought you referenced version like sixty four. That was two years, one year yeah. ago. Well, I remember we also wrote this sort of uh, online book called 30 Days of UI 5 when 1.30 came out. And that was that seems ages ago now. Yes. <laughs> Ronnie says, yeah, it's 172.1. Oh, yeah. And because Ronnie's got an awesome um, website and web service that tells us about the latest versions of UI 5, which he's just posted a link to. Thank you, Leo. Gray haired UI 5 developer. Is that you or me? OK. So. Um... And that's all we had to do for writing, writing this very simple application. And you might have noticed we only changed UI-related files. And our app router is still running. So if I didn't do anything wrong and I just refresh this page. Da, 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 da. Well, we've got the list. You can see the XML changes and, and the updates. Yes. yes. All the products from the Northwind service, if I click on an item, it says you pressed item 18, just to make it easier. To, so if I press the second one, I press product two. Nice. That's so, nice. And now I'm not sure if we have time. I will at least start to build it. So I will go back to the main directory. Also, um, now I want to build it to de actually deploy the application to Cloud Foundry. So um, let's have a look at this build script. I can, like, obviously, I can open the Main package JSON in the in the tree on the right, but I can also say open file. Yeah, and then I say package JSON. Oh, and uh, obviously because I did the npm install already, Woo! many but any package. Any package. <laughs> here's the main one, and yeah, if I scroll down, I just okay, I selected the wrong one. That's the package lock. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> let's do it the old school way from the tree. And here I can uh, execute this npm run deploy. The, that looks familiar from our uh, cap code jam. Uh... Exactly. So it will do quite some stuff. Don't I mean, do. it will fail. OK, let's see why. Let's. A little bit further up. Interesting. mpt command next one. Oops, there. Okay, Maybe start. you can also make the uh, the terminal a bit bigger with the vertical thing. Oh yes. If I can catch it. So now I execute the same command, so probably it fails again. Command not found. MBT. What? What? It is. Oh, maybe the reference to the command in the actual deploy script. Is different a different uh, referencing a different one? Build M MB M build UI blah, 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 MBT. Oh, that seems all right. Let's just add it. NPX. Yeah. Still. I remember when uh, I was first introduced to MPX by Marius. I'm thinking, what the hell is this? But uh, I, I'm a big fan of MPX now. Robert, goodbye. Mm -hmm. Thanks for 
Thanks for joining. Okay. I mean, let's do it. If it won't work out of the NPM script, let's just execute it from here because <laughs> I think it's probably an issue that we have here when we define the path. Yeah. There was some there were some uh, you know random uh, random things that we've done here, so anything could have happened. Yeah. By the way, I, I guess also um, you know we've got this. You know, I've asked Marius deliberately to you know bump up his font so people can see it nicely. But of course, you know this this light VS Code. If you've got a big screen, you can do all sorts of stuff. Lots of windows open. It's super awesome. Yeah. And uh, now this time it worked. You can see here in the MTA archives. Here's our application. So let's do the CF deploy. Obviously, the CF deploy plugin is already pre-installed, so we don't have to install it as well uh, or separately. Mm -hmm. And then I can just trigger it. It should be done really fast. What we could do in the meantime is maybe I can show you some more things about uh, VS Code, uh, not VS Code, the Business Application Studio. <laughs> the there are really that we have. <laughs> So uh, here on the side, you see plugins that uh, are already pre-installed. But if you want to have a closer look, you can also go to View and say, yeah, basically, you see here all plugins. When you select plugins, you see what is pre-installed. And there are SQL tools, because uh, we selected uh, Dev space for cup development. So obviously we knew the, you need SQL tools and SQLite, VS Code CDS, some tools you're already familiar with, like Yeoman here. I'm wondering if there's a VS a plugin for Vim, Vim key bindings. I mean, ideally you should be able to use. I mean, to be fair, I always say ideally because I've never tried it myself because I'm happy with what I have here. But <laughs> it should work to install a VS Code. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I'm not sure that. Extension marketplace. Some programming dude. Yes, plus one for Vim. Definitely, David. Definitely. Oh yeah, one thing that I didn't show you yet is when I opened XML. I think I have to reset the font size a little bit. So let's do the original one. You don't have to be able to read what I'm showing because when I select the view, I can also open it in the Layout editor that you're already familiar with in the web ID. And this is, yeah, this is an example of what, what the team have been doing, which is to, to bring over some of the tools from Web IDE and run them in a sort of a container inside of the business, <coughs> business application studio. So the stuff that you're used to in Web IDE, you're still going to get in the business application studio. Yes. And it, I mean, you said it perfectly. Everything that you're used to it, like drawing, uh, drag and drop controls. Say hello, sub dev. Then you have your button. You can basically change the width. Yep. Hey, hi, Phil. Phil's just joined to make a cameo appearance just before we finish. Lovely, and, lovely for you to drop in. Awesome. And you've seen the deployment finished. So let me just copy the URL, paste it here. Oh, I. Mark said he never used the layout editor. No, Mark, um, I, I, I've used it a few times, but uh, you know I prefer writing uh, XML, and you know you know where you are with XML, right? Yes. I mean, I agree that the layout editor is really a nice feature to get started, but I think once yeah. you're complex <laughs> guys, you might use it to render it to see like a previewish mode, but I won't wouldn't use it to. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think to be honest, the audience of you know our, our audience here, our family of hands-on SAP Dev folks, you know, are more attuned to just you know writing writing uh, directly XML. But uh, there's a lot of people who all, who really you know enjoy using the layout editor. I do I do know that. Um, so Nabi said this this is great, a great leap, awesome stuff. Yeah, I, I agree. Me to end one cool thing that I want to show. I saved it for the end. Is that you noticed, uh, let me make the font size a little bit bigger again. Uh, By the way, sorry, I think I masked your uh, Tada moment. That, that that UI is now running from Cloud Foundry, right? Yes, absolutely. This is on Cloud Foundry connecting to the same service instance that we created earlier and connecting to the OData service. Where, the service. Can you just show the tab again so we can see the URL? Sure. Here, I think. Yeah, it was this one. There we go. Yeah. Nice. And um, what I want to show you is that basically what I did to open it, I copy and pasted 
the URL from the command from the log here because um, unfortunately the Cloud Foundry uh, CLI doesn't print the protocol, so it only prints the route, which is why there is no uh, why I cannot click the link. Yeah, but this is the, also a great example how open this ID is. I can just use an echo and do a crap. And basically, if I execute this simple command, basically I have it with uh, the same URL with HTTP yes, in the front. Right. I do a command click, and here's my application running. What a, what a fantastic thing to end on using proper tools like Echo and Orc and Grep. Marius, I'm so proud of you. And thank you for a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, live stream episode. Uh, I think a lot, a lot of people, including me, everybody has really, um, uh, really enjoyed this. Uh, it, I think, I think this is a, a huge step in the right direction. Uh, Marius, thank you so much for uh, for joining. It's it's already nine oh one, so I've got to end. But I just noticed some programming dude has said something about uh, Uncle Bob's organic dried pears. Exactly, that always makes me uh, smile. So on that uh, on that bombshell, thank you very much for watching. Um, I'm going to end the stream thank now. You. And uh, yeah, Marius, we'll have you on again, uh, whether you like it or not. Thanks very much thank indeed, you. Marius, and thanks, folks, for joining. Bye.